You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, Episode 3, 2018, Year of the Perzine, Part 1. Zine friends, welcome back to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix, and let's talk about zines. Episode three. <laughs> Woo. I, I think I'm just going to continue to be impressed every time I'm to a new episode. I mean, maybe I'll get used to it when I'm at episode 50 or something. You know, knock on wood that I get that far. <laughs> but yeah, hey, it's another episode. Go figure. Nobody's more surprised than me. <laughs> Moving along, I want to say thank you again to the lovely feedback I had to the first episode, though I do feel I have two apologies to issue. First of all, last week I mentioned at by Diana on Twitter, but turns out that her name is Diana, which I think is really cool. She was totally fine with it, of course, but I do feel that I want to put the correction out there anyway. And the next apology goes to my friend Bodhi. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sure he was just joking around, but he did tweet at me that he's really not sure if he's actually making zines anymore after listening to the first podcast. <laughs> so yeah, my bad. I promise Bodhi you are definitely making zines and awesome ones at that. I will have his links below because he makes really cool zines. So yes, thank you for the lovely feedback. Apologies all around. And I just, uh, I wanted to point out a YouTube comment from last week. Uh, Feral, Feral Publication said, Zines are working class literature. That's how he defines zines. And I thought that was fantastic. It reminded me of the Poor Last Zine podcast. Well, and their zines, of course. So for this week, this episode, this week, <laughs> Uh, this episode, I do have a little bit of an announcement, and that is the Zine Collector podcast is now on Spotify. Yay. If I could do sound effects, I'd do like a crowd applause or something like that. I'll work on that. I'm, I'm still learning all this stuff. But yeah, it's now on Spotify, I'm very proud to say. Uh, Pippa, the place where I host my uh, podcast, approached me about being listed in consideration for Spotify. They were having a meeting with Spotify and yeah, I signed up and lo and behold, I've been accepted. <laughs> or the podcast has anyway. <laughs> so yeah, upwards and onwards, that's for sure. That um, makes five places that you can find the zine collector now. All the links are in the description. I won't list them out here. <laughs> Moving along. I do want to have like a segment at the beginning, which I've kind of been doing already, which is feedback and responses. Now, this is sort of my response to what I talked about last week. One of the things I mentioned about zines was um, that they are not usually made for profit. If someone talks about, hey, I'm going to make some zines to make some money, any knowledgeable zine maker might have a bit of a chuckle because it's not it is not the best money making endeavor it's money is not usually the focus the thing i wanted to make clear was that i do think this topic merits an entire show all itself i apologize if you heard that noise at all i whacked my uh microphone thing a little bit anyway i do think this uh merits its own show, but I wanted to talk about it while it was uh, fresh in my mind as well as, you know, just in the last podcast. Zine pricing. I want to be really clear that I am not against making a profit on your zines. I totally admire the standpoint where people feel zines should be free, zines should be not for profit, that sort of thing. I Like, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I admire that. But at the same time, I'm looking around at the world, I'm seeing the way things are, I'm seeing how many people are struggling just to get by, and I feel that that kind of ideal, while quite lovely and definitely do it if you can sort of thing, is becoming 
<clears throat> excuse me again, uh, more and more unreasonable. I think people have to do whatever they can to put food on the table and sometimes that scenes. Sometimes it's not going to get you a lot, but you know, you do what you can to try to figure out how to live in this day and age when things are so expensive, etc., etc. The problem I have with profits, and I will be the first to say that this is a blurry line, that there there is no cut and dry this is this and this is this with me. But I get a bit sticky about pricing when I feel like people are being taken taken advantage of. And what I mean by that is say I know from what information I have in a zine description, when I'm looking on Etsy or something like that, in the description, from that information, if I know that zine costs 10 cents to make or 20 cents, if I know that it costs that little and you're charging, say, $5 for it, then I'm like, really? Like, I don't want to judge because I don't know people's financial positions and everything, but I have also, I feel like that's trying to take advantage of the community almost. I, I, I don't like this implication that I can produce something for 10 cents and, you know, get $5 for it. And, and again, I like, I, I hate confrontation. I hate giving opinions because I don't like fights and stuff like that. So I, I, I know that this is not a clear issue, but I just wanted to make it clear that I'm not against profits. I'm, not, I'm really not, but I am against maybe overdoing it. You know, it's, it's all, it's a bit subjective and I apologize for that. I wish I had a firmer definition or margin or something like that. Basically, I want everybody to get by. I don't want anybody to be starving, but I also don't want people to feel that they can't access scenes, that they are excluded from the community because of price. If you have a $10, a $15, a $20 zine, yes, I have seen them, a $20 zine, if you have that out there, then be clear, please, why it's priced the way it is. If you have special paper, if you have a large number of pages, if you pay your contributors, all of that stuff factors in, but let me know. I mean, personally, if you have a $10 zine, I probably still can't afford it, but I feel better knowing that, okay, this is $10 because this, this, and this. Be clear. That's all I'm asking. Be clear about why something is. And if you think that, you know, a $4.50 profit on a 10 cent zine, um, kind of judging for taxes and uh, Etsy listing fees, if you think that's cool, then that's your thing. But all I'm asking is just be clear so I know what I'm buying and who I'm buying from. That sort of thing. Moving along to zine events. Now, I have a little range of zine events from February 9th to the 21st. And I will read them off as per usual. On February 9th in Auckland, New Zealand. And please forgive me, I cannot pronounce the, the native names. I apologize very humbly. But in Auckland, Auckland, New Zealand on the 9th, we have the free same same queer zine workshop. Also on the 9th in Kyoto, Japan, we have the morning zine circle number 17. On February 10th in Elsternwick, Victoria in Australia, we have the craft zine, craft zine and record market. Also on the 10th in Berkeley, California, we have the zine scene. And lastly, on February 10th, in Nottingham, UK, we have Write, Print, Share, Creative Writing, and Zine Making Workshops. On the 11th, in Melbourne, Australia, we have Festival of the Photocopier. I'm getting a little teary, because I know so many friends will be there, and I won't. Oh, go to Festival of the Photocopier if you're anywhere around Melbourne. It's really amazing. On February 13th in Prescott Valley, Arizona, we have a teen zine workshop. On February 14th in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we have dirty zine reading. Intriguing. <laughs> On February 16th and 17th in Ghent, 
or Gent. Not sure. Belgium. We have GGB Clubhouse times FEL equals 24 hour zine challenge. Oh, I've never done a 24 hour zine challenge yet. I might have to do that this year. Check it off the old bucket list. On February 18th in Perth, Australia, we have the world's tiniest zine fair. And I'm completely biased because one of my zines is in there, but it is so cool. They're tiny zines. They're like A7 and, well, A6, A7, and A8, that sort of thing. It is so cool. Definitely check it out if you are able. On February 19th in Lawrence, Kansas, we have monthly mini zine Mondays. Oh, that's fantastic. Mini scene Mondays. I love it. And finally, on February 21st in Somerville, Massachusetts. There we go. <laughs> Massachusetts. We have graphic novels, fanzines, and comics crafter noon. So that's it for zine events around the world. If you would like a direct line to zine events, or would like to make sure that your zine event is listed in the World Zine Event Calendar, Check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook and Patreon now. Links are in the description. So now we get to the meat of the matter. Or the tofu, if that's uh, your life choice. <laughs> in the last episode, we talked about what zines are, defining zines, and how definitions don't quite fit zines. In this episode, we're talking about perzines. If you hadn't already got that from the title. That is right, my zine friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you in February to 2018, Year of the Perzine. It's a year for sharing our lives, our stories, and our worldviews in zine form. Year of the Perzine was born of a desire to see more Perzines at Zine Fest. Alex Rex started a discussion in one of the zine groups, Zines A Go Go, and talked about basically not seeing them as much as she used to. Now, I don't know if there's any specific uh, events or anything for Perzines, but I do know that there are a couple of zine fests that have taken up the call and are putting a special focus on Perzines. And those two are Dear Diary Zine Fest happening in Oakland, California in late February, as well as the Massachusetts Feminist Zine Fest happening in April. So what are perzines and why would we dedicate an entire year to them? All zines have a personal element to them, but perzines are specifically about personal life stories and reflections and that sort of thing. I mean, perzine is short for personal zine. They are their own genre within the zineverse. But as per usual with scenes, definitions are a little bit bendy. Uh, some of my favorite perzines have uh, fiction writing, poetry, art, reviews, that sort of thing. So while you have perzines that have the overall focus, you can still have elements of other scenes within them. Perzines can be about any facet of your life, basically, as long as it's about your life. Uh, but I would say many, if not the majority of perzines are often about, you know, deep, big, intense subjects. In an article I found called Why One Community Chooses Not to Tell Their Stories on the Internet, Sarah Boboltz writes, Perzines dig into serious subjects. Many of the perzines I encountered in my research touch on depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD, or a combination of various conditions. Making and distributing zines provides for many a community to connect with and discuss shared experiences, but that seems to ring true for perzine writers more so than any others. Now, I'm not sure if you're hearing that noise, but I do apologize if you are. Wanderer is making a coffee. In the perzines I've read, I can confidently say that most mention things along the lines of mental health and mental illness, questions about identity and sexuality, and pretty much most deep subjects in between. I don't know if it's despite of or because of or, or something like that. I love Perzines. I, I adore them. They, they're easily one of my favorite zine genres out there. 
when I was a kid, I was always reading biographies and stuff like that. In long summer breaks from school, I would treasure the life update letters I'd get from my friends. The stories I read that were fiction, I still wanted to know about people. I didn't really care as much about stories, about places and things like that. I wanted to know about people. And like really the only thing that makes me sad about perzines is that I didn't find them sooner, really. When it comes to writing perzines, you may be faced with the question, and usually from this question comes from people who aren't as familiar with scenes, why not just write a memoir? The first thing that springs to mind with that is why one of the reasons that zines exist in the first place, and that's because unpopular and or unwelcome voices wanted a way to share their words. They wanted a way to speak and be heard and talk amongst themselves and things like that. And thus, and not just because of this, but largely because of the zines keep on going because they push away this thought that they need the approval of some publisher to be able to speak, to be able to be heard. And I know what some people are thinking. Well, you don't need publishers these days. It's when it's self-published. But for the context of this conversation, it's zines basically are the same thing. Zines are self-publishing. What we are doing making zines is self-publishing. So what I'm talking about and what I think a lot of people who have said to me, why not just write a memoir? They're talking about getting your life story or life stories published through a publisher. The thing about memoirs that annoys me in, re in the respect of like maybe publishing one is that there's this idea, there's this feeling that you have to be X amount of years old before you can actually write one, before your life is valid or whatever they're saying. They, like, you need to live so long before you have lived enough to write a memoir, that sort of thing. Like, there's nothing like that in the zine verse. Like, there are kids making zines, and that's fantastic, and that's the way it should be. You don't have to be so old to, you know, get the stamp of validation, and now you can write about yourself. I think that's just BS. When I was 24, someone said to me that I would have a great memoir someday. The sentiment was really lovely, and I and for a long time I held on to that as, you know, that's the loveliest thing anyone's ever said to me. You know, that may be sad, in your opinion. I don't know, I'll leave that up to you. But the thing is, someday. Someday? Like, I had to wait? I would have a great memoir someday? Because the thing was, at 24, at 24 years old, I figured I'd done a fair bit of living. I was an abuse survivor. I literally ran away to Australia from Wisconsin, and I had already found reasonable success as a professional blogger and an online publicist. Do I qualify for an early application, or how does that work in the memoir world? How do you know when you're done enough with a part of your life to write about it in a way that a publisher would accept? It's incredibly frustrating to me. And yet, you know, introducing perzines. Write about your life as you're living it. You don't have to hit a milestone to start writing. You don't have to get approval to start writing. You don't have to get a stamp. You don't have to get anyone saying. You can just start writing about your life as you're living it. Wonderful. <laughs> so... I'm not saying I'm against memoirs. Like, I, I read memoirs. I read memoirs. I like memoirs. It's, it's lovely, and they're lovely in and by their own right. I'm not trying to talk you out of writing a memoir if that's what you want to do. All I'm saying is, one, you don't have to wait. And don't let anybody try to convince you that you have to wait. And two, you don't need anyone's approval. Not anyone's approval. It's your life. It's your perspective. And I don't care if you're six or 60. The way you see things has value. Okay? Don't let anybody try to convince you that it doesn't because you do. Okay? Trust me. Trust this crazy zine person from Australia, alright? <laughs>
Now, the other thing about Persines, and I feel like this is more confusing to people because writing a memoir, publishing, like, I think more people understand why you might not do that. But this one's confusing because people, well, let's just get into it. Why not just blog? To answer that, in part, I go back to the article, Why One Community Chooses Not to Tell Their Stories on the Internet. After Erla Legault's sister died of cancer, the 55-year-old British Columbian turned to her long-term hobby to process her grief. She said, I know, for me, getting it out of my body really helped. Cultural taboos may stymie discussion of certain emotional subjects, but you can still put it all down on paper. It's just really immediate. That's what I liked about it, she explained, adding that she didn't seem a similar authenticness on the internet, a medium designed to connect people. Can even the most intimate blogs and message boards compare with the closeness of words on paper? I think that part of the article makes a very good point when it comes to blogs and persines. Now, I don't think it should be blogs versus persines because I often I think they both have their own place in the world. But as much as I would like to be able to find the exact words to tell you why words on a screen aren't words on a page for me, I'd love to be able to explain to say, hey, this X, Y, Z, but I can't. It, the thing is that I simply have to accept and I think a lot of people understand and accept without being able to explain it that words on a page, whether they're typed or written or copied or anything like that, words on a page will always be more personal, personal and more intimate than words on a screen. I think that's just the reality of the situation, even though we may not understand it. Now, another side note, I'm not against per blogging, (laughs) personal blogging. Personal blogging is how I met my best friend of like, what, decade now, something like that. It's been ages, we're old. (laughs) And Sea Green Zines is a blog. It's not quite a personal blog, but it's at least, you know, (laughs) semi-per. semi per there's nothing inherently wrong with that but that's amusing to me some for some reason but what it all comes down to is that i like blogging i like persines but a blog is not a persine they they just aren't the same and i don't think they ever will be it's just the nature of what they are so now that those things are out of the way why don't we talk about something that actually feels a little good (laughs) feels a bit better than saying it's not a memoir and it's not a blog something that you know a bit inspiring at least i hope it will be i mean after all what would a podcast about persings be without an actual personal story involved so when i was trying to take all of my sticky notes and all of my scribbled thoughts on scraps of paper and trying to organize them into something that at least resembled a show to make sense. That would make sense. Not for my speaking about it, apparently. (laughs) When I was doing all of that, I realized that I didn't just want to tell you about Persines and I didn't want to just tell you why they're not like a blog or why they're not like a memoir. The thing I wanted to really get across is why I feel that Persines are important. They are, are an important genre within an important media. I mean, really what I'd like to do is convince you to make a Persine and then maybe send me a copy just because I like zines. <laughs> but I do realize that Persines are not going to be for everybody no matter how much I want them to be. So in case I haven't made it clear and in in case you're not sure if you want to make a perzine and in case maybe you're not quite feeling the year of the perzine vibes just yet let me tell you about a perzine series called pieces 
Pieces is a perzine series started by Nicole, aka Corridor Girl, in 2010. This is the first perzine series I ever read, and as far as I can recall, I'm not 100% sure, but fairly, fairly sure that this is actually uh, the first zine trade I ever made. At least the, tra I, the first zine I traded for zines I traded for were numbers one through five. Keep in mind that this, when I traded for these, they were, this was early days for me. I had barely discovered zines, uh, made the trade with Nicole through wemakezines.com, or I think it was a Ning, yes, it was the Ning back then. So yeah, I was very new to zines, and this was my first experience with Per zines. So with that in mind, pieces blew my mind. It just, it amazed me. The whole concept was so cool. She was sharing her life. She was writing about her life. Anything she wanted to share, anything she wanted to throw out into the world, she was doing. And she was making it into a zine. So, and making copies and anybody, anybody could read them. Like she was open for trades and I believe still is open for trades and things like that. And it wasn't just that she was writing about all these things. It was that she was writing about them and then choosing a typeface and then choosing backgrounds and not just saying things to the world through her words, but also in how she chose to present things and how they looked in the size and the number of pages and things like that. Everything was a choice. Everything was, everything was self-expression. Everything was, hi, this is me. And the thing was, it just got better. <laughs> we had so much in common. It just, you know, not spoken a lot. We basically arranged the trade and that was that. And then I get these zines and I'm like, we have so much in common. Yay. We both ident self-identified as writers as at a young age. We both got pulled up by teachers for using UK English spelling instead of American English spelling. We both met Garth Nix. We both struggled with some writer's block. We both found inspiration in Stephen King's on writing. Like, and that's just a few examples just from the first issue. Like, <laughs> It was amazing to me. All of a sudden, I had access to someone's thoughts and experiences and world views and and she was so much like me. <laughs> it just I don't know. I don't know if I just got into this space where I forgot that I had that I could have things in common with other people that I just I felt so different and so weird. And I mean, it was about the time when we had moved from Ringwood to Bendigo and what few friends I had were now distant friends and that sort of thing. And, and yeah, I felt especially alone at that time. And suddenly there's Nicole across the world and they were just so, <laughs> we just had so much in common. It's, it still boggles my mind a bit, to be quite honest. The thing is, because we had so much in common, but all, and, and but not just because of that. It, it, it was because she... It was like she just trusted the world with her words. She trusted the world with her life. Because you, you can never be 100% sure who's going to read your zine. So you're, you're basically trusting humanity to look at your life and examine it and, and, and take what they want from it. And the thing about reading about Nicole's life was that the things she thought about and went through and examined in herself made me look at my own life. Not just in the things she wrote about, but it, it made me realize how much I took, took for granted, really, about my life and my personality and my views and stuff like that. And the, there were so many things I hadn't questioned that Nicole was questioning about herself and her ideas and things like that. And there were facets of her that 
were completely foreign to me. And yet, like, I'd never thought about it. And it was, and it's, that's something I like about Persians in general, that there are life experiences and there are life views that I simply will never have. So reading Persians is a way to expand my view of the world and expand my view of people and open myself up to better understanding of where where other people are coming from. And the thing is, that was really beautiful to me then and is really beautiful to me now because I'm pretty highly socially anxious, is that I had all of this, all of the intimacy really of like being a pen pal with her but without the pressure of I've written to you and now you have to respond there it was such a warm and welcoming thing to me to find Persians and they they were there they were there you read them when you want as you want take them as you want and you don't have to respond you can dismiss them, you can apply them to your life, you can think about them, you can do whatever, and you can respond if you want to. Well, I mean, at least I could with Nicole, because she always put um, contact details in the back. Some people don't, and then that's just what it is, and you don't respond and that sort of thing. But what Nicole did was she never put the pressure on to respond, but she left the door open, and I just... I really, I really, I love that. I love the the welcoming and yet security of knowing that I didn't have to engage if I didn't want to. So it wasn't just loving the concept or the fact that we had so much in common that has kept me reading pieces over the years. I think the latest one is number 13. Pieces has helped me feel not so alone, not just in the moment of reading, but over the over the course of the years as well, as she's been creating this series. And that's the thing, it is an ongoing series. As Nicole is living her life, growing and changing, so am I. Just getting these zines over the years has been a reminder that I'm not just swimming in this fishbowl alone, you know, that sort of thing. It's we're we're all doing, living, changing, growing and to, I mean, I think that's something the Persian series has over a memoir because it's not quite real time, of course, but it's almost like real time that, that, you know, a person's mind changes, a person has realizations and that sort of thing. It's it participating in someone living and growing and, and someone outside of yourself and makes you think outside of yourself and that... And I hope I'm making sense. I really hope I'm making sense because this has been a very important concept for me to get my head around as, as I'm growing to be, well, as close to a functional adult as I can be, really. If I look through the years, pieces one, Nicole and I had so much in common and that was just mind blowing, you know, worlds away, that sort of thing. Pieces four on lucid dreaming. This encouraged me to get into lucid dreaming myself, to investigate it, to try it. And yes, I have had lucid dreams in there. Pretty cool if you ask me. Over the course of pieces as a series, she's written so much about mental health, mental illness and stuff like that. It's helped me to become, to feel more at peace with my own feelings about medications and how I approach things and therapists and um, psychiatrists. Now I have permission to read a little bit. Nicole said it was okay to help me show things, basically. And in pieces 11, she writes, I'm unsure of my diagnosis, but at this point, semantics don't matter. The therapist who terminated my treatment had me with borderline personality disorder, but the therapist after her, who was the best therapist I'd ever seen and who restored my faith in therapists overall, felt that because I didn't lack empathy, I didn't fit into the borderline spectrum. She, however, specialized in dissociative disorders, so perhaps she was colored with a bit of bias. Major depressive, BPD, dissociative disorder, I'm realizing the label doesn't matter. As long as I can understand myself, my strengths, my limitations, and my own brand of self-care, I can manage. There's too much overlap between diagnoses anyhow. 
that small bit of writing when I first read it helped me to relax so much about the alphabet soup that it is my experience of my various diagnoses in the mental health system. It helped me to see, yeah, there are a lot, there is a lot of overlap and it, and it helped me to start looking at myself as a human rather than all of these labels that didn't change a lot, but changed enough to leave me quite frustrated and confused. To see that she had the strength to let go of the labels and just go, okay, I am who I am, let's go from here, inspired me to do so. So to say I have identified with Nicole a lot over the years is probably a bit of an understatement. But the thing about her whole series that has had the uh, most impact on me is actually something we don't have in common. And it's something she wrote about in Pieces 13. Now, Pieces 13 on being a romantic asexual. Thanks to this scene, I have learned that under the asexual banner, there are different types of asexuality, one of them being demisexual, uh, a term I'd had never heard of before. But according to the zine, Demisexuals do not experience what some call primary sexual attraction. This means a demisexual person only experiences sexual attraction after a close emotional bond is formed with another person. It's important to note that the emotional bond does not have to be romantic in nature. Demisexuals are not sexually attracted to strangers, celebrities, acquaintances, blind dates, people they think are good looking but don't know or don't have any emotional connection to. Please note this does not mean demisexuals think their love or attraction is above or more valid than folks who experience sexual attraction to the kinds of people listed above. Demisexuals just have a different sexual attraction pathway to follow. I remember the day I read that. I remember it quite clearly. Afternoon, sitting in the recliner, reading the zine. I had to stop reading. I literally closed the zine and put it down and just had to sit and think. Her sharing that definition, her writing about that. And that's not even, demisexuality is not the focus of that zine. Demisexuality is three paragraphs and 46 pages about being a romantic asexual. Nicole was being thorough. Nicole was listing out the different flavors of asexuality and she was covering her, ba covering her bases and she was making sure that people understood that asexuality has a spectrum just like many other things. In those three paragraphs, she <laughs> please forgive me, I'm struggling a bit because those three paragraphs changed me. They helped me not only to identify, but also to claim a huge part of who I am. I'd never heard of demisexuality. I had always thought I was just a bit weird, a bit different from my friends. I didn't think about it too much. But when I read that word and that label and that definition, so much of my life suddenly slid into place. So much made sense. I, I had a place somewhere. That part of me had a name. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the power of Perzines. <laughs> I, I hope I am doing a good job of imparting exactly how monumental that moment was to me because it continues to affect me as I do more research, as I look into things more, as I understand more about myself. And again, three paragraphs in a 46 page persine. There you go. <laughs> as you may have been able to tell, considering the length that this podcast is going to be, the subject of persines became one that was huge 
very quickly. I thought it'd be a, a quick and easy thing to talk about, but boom, there was so much I wanted to say and so much I wanted to get across. And that became especially clear when my friend Wolfram at Queer Content on Twitter, on Twitter tweeted at me, on Twitter tweeted at me, consent is probably the biggest issue with persines, particularly if it talks about other people. Not only is it polite to have consent, but you could get, land yourself in hot water if you don't. Now, I'm not going to start on the issue of consent in this episode. It's definitely already quite long enough. So next week, I will be chatting about consent and about the uh, complicated nature of writing about other people in your zine. Now, as much as I'm sure you want me to wrap this up, I do have a little bit of a, a, a note I want to end this segment on and basically say this. When it comes to perzines of any sort, short, long, you know, intense, not intense, a lot of people say, my life isn't interesting. Nobody will care. Why would I write a perzine? Nobody will care. And to anyone thinking that, to anyone feeling that, I care. I do. I care. If you want to make a persine and you're worried because you think nobody will care, well, now you know I do. Now, I'm just some zine-obsessed crazy lady living in Australia doing podcasts and reviewing scenes and stuff like that. Like, I'm, I'm just me. But if, if people not caring is the one reason stopping you from making a persine, well, don't let it stop you because I care. Go make that persine. <laughs> Okay, I have talked a lot this episode about various things, so I will keep the Q&A portion of the episode pretty short because it's a pretty short answer. The question is, will I be at Festival of the Photocopier 2018? And as much as I would like to say yes, I'm afraid I won't be there. Uh, I tried, I really did, but I just couldn't make the logistics of everything work and I'm very, very sad, but I hope that all my friends and zine friends go and have a wonderful time and share lots of pictures online, videos, that sort of thing, all sorts, because, you know, I can't go, but maybe I can just live vicariously through you a little bit. (laughs) That sort of thing. So lots of pictures, please, for those of us who aren't able to make it this year. Because the time is going, I'm going to save the sharing is caring Uh, spotlight for next week just in the interest of time so that is it for today my zine friends thank you again so much for joining me i hope my prattle on per zines made at least a little bit of sense for you remember that everything i say is just my opinion there are no gatekeepers in the zine verse nor should there ever be links to everything i talk about are going to be in the description be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. Now, the music for this podcast, the kick and tune at the beginning and the end, is called Spanish Summer by Audionautics and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix, and until next time... Go make a zine or five. Ah. <laughs>